Well, so good evening and good afternoon to all uh, present here. I'm honored to have with us uh, Mr. Sergey Sergey. So I'll welcome you, sir. Basically, uh, Mr. Sergey focuses on AI projects in e-commerce, which developing a platform called ShopUp. And he's one of the founders of the Data Science Society. Sergey is a special brit specialist called e-commerce marketing data scientist. A wizard uh, that can leverage each commerce business by applying latest AI models in day-to-day -day, uh, digital marketers work. In 2014, he graduated an executive MBA with honor from Vienna University. And uh, previously, for more than five years, he worked as an uh, operation and business manager in large companies like uh, Experian and uh, Ingram Micro. He has more than 15 years of experience in artificial intelligence, data science, machine learning, and data mining, uh, which are applied to e-commerce, uh, retail, telecoms, and banking sectors. As a part of his journey, uh, he participated in different uh, startup projects where he applies AI uh, like mobile tickets for uh, public transport, its name as a Tiki, e-commerce, that is a MaxCart, in retail shop up Wi-Fi, in robotics, uh, sense.ai, and in email marketing, uh, decision marketing. With this a brief introduction, I request Mr. Sergey to deliver his today's lecture on how dig digitalization and AI can connect supply and demand in retail and bring the business to a new era. Thank you, sir, for coming and giving your time. So over to you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shantanu. Yeah, I, was, I was so pleased when, uh, when your dean contacted me and uh, I mean, being part of a data science society, I like to share some of my knowledge with uh, students and uh, graduates and wannabes of the data science. Uh, so I will direct. I will start. So I need just to share my screen. Uh, just a second. Mm. Yeah. Can you confirm? Is that? Can, it's coming. Okay. So uh, what I will talk about, about the digitalization in AI, but uh, as uh, Chantal mentioned, I mean, my background uh, is uh, working in a, in a data science for more than, than 15 years. Something else, what uh, really passion, I mean, when I started with the data science, it, it, it was like a hobby. Uh, as you have heard, I mean, I was uh, operational manager, but then this idea with the startup project just arised, and uh, I start uh, dealing with different different projects in that area. So uh, yeah, I, I'm also I was speaking in a different conferences, uh, uh, yes, primarily in Europe, so and sometimes online uh, with uh, within within Asia. Well, I'm also a mentor of uh, a couple of universities and uh, one of the jury's members of the two AI congresses in, uh, in Europe. And a part of that, uh, probably, I was wondering, should I add this, uh, this slide? But just to give you an overview what kind of customers we have work, work on, they are in different sectors. So we have in e-commerce, retail, uh, software as a service and in media. I mean, two of them are one of the biggest here within, within uh, the region. I'm, I'm from Bulgaria. Yeah, I, I for, for, forget to mention that. And um, the agenda, the agenda, I was really wondering what should I cover and what kind of topic. Uh, here, what I decided that uh, for the time which, uh, which, which I have, just to give you a kind of an overview, first of all, with the AI advancement, just to be sure that we are setting the floor right and just right expectation. I would try to cover some of the latest areas. Uh, uh, then um, retail overview, I will just give you the di diagram of, and main, main, main players. 
who are um, in the online ecosystem. Then uh, an overview of the data, what kind of data is there, how to structure it, how to get it, how to enrich it and such kind of stuff. Main problems which, which we see. And, uh, and primarily, uh, e e examples examples of uh, of some of the two projects which which I choose two projects so just to uh, and uh, speak around that so about the AI advancement uh, here my 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 idea is just to show uh, what kind of areas uh, have uh, have developed something which I really like is the first one is uh, the probably you know the reinforcement learning so this is uh, this is the way uh, how we learn normally here what is shown is uh, uh, we are uh, telling the computer uh, how to play a game how to play tennis and then uh, we reward it or punish it and and based on that you see that within here in 16 trials it starts returning uh, 60 uh, 79 percent so here it's more or less uh, we are uh, putting it in a real life, providing a framework and the way it needs to, and then how to be rewarded and or punished. So this is one of the way is uh, it is used uh, for robots. Something similar, which all of you um, probably know, is uh, about the DeepMind. DeepMind, they they decided to challenge with their two models uh, to a, a lot of games. One of them is Go one of the most humanitarian humanic uh, game which is so complex and uh, six years ago they beat uh, the the champion uh, the south uh, lisa Lis uh, then what else and they use the same the same approach with reinforcement learning they uh, make a lot of games a lot of games where the model was punished if he loses or it, it he was rewarded so here it was uh, something that the expert in uh, go mentioned that uh, the strategy and there is even a kind of innovation there in the way uh, alpha alpha go model plays the other is an uh, alpha star again uh, i think again five years uh, year, year year after alpha, alpha go was beaten uh, there was an alpha star and again top players of uh, of, star, of uh, star, starcraft were uh, were were beaten and uh, a part of that uh, probably this is uh, something else which is for the languages part uh, two years ago the gpt2 model was uh, was introduced from uh, open ai and it was the main idea was that you write a kind of a statement a sentence and then it automatically start generating text here there is a good example and probably you have heard that uh, the last month there is a new model called which is a chatbot based on GPT-3. Yeah, so you see how how uh, surprised is that guy. I would just give you an example. Uh, you can find uh, OpenAI and then try the chatbot. And for instance, for the chatbot, <laughs> we can write different questions. We can write a question, for instance, how uh, to become data scientist. And let's see what, what it will answer. Uh, for you can uh, become a data science, uh, yeah. So it, it explains that you need to earn a bachelor degree in the field related to the data science, then gain experience working with data. This can include internship, part-time jobs, uh, even concerning uh, earning a master's degree of data science and develop a, start, a strong portfolio. Uh, of work that showcase your skill experience also continue to learn so there are it really helps uh, well 
even one of one of my uh, yeah we can also uh, ask for a pandas let's say uh, let's say how to merge two data uh, frames in pandas and let's see i think it will show also also in call uh yeah what i was trying to say that one, one of my colleagues for one of the problems he uh, he was supposed to convert json json to data frame and uh, it shows him a library which then he uses so here it it writes code it to it it understand first of all it understand what you're asking about and then find the relevant uh, answer uh, you can play with this uh, later on, but just to give you an idea that the text here uh, can be very, uh, very distinguished, and uh, and there is a there is a big big jump in that area. Uh, let me just continue further. A part of the text, a part of the how we we can learn uh, learn. There is a with the images, the GAN, the GAN manual, uh, generative adversarial net, uh, network. So it generates images. So it combines uh, the images of the guy plus the one, the guy which we we are interested in it. Uh, repeat that. I mean, it can be for the Angelina Jolie or Brad Pitt. So this was, uh, I think this year, uh, IBM Russia uh, latest paper in terms of how they generated this. Uh, then even we can we can see that the AI goes into the our DNAs. I mean, AI can predict the structure of every protein. So the protein here it's a sequence of letters, four letters. And normally for the human being it it's long like imagine that you are starting writing this letter and it's long, long like 100 to 200 kilometers. So such such long of DNAs. Also uh, you have seen what now is the World Cup, you all know, and AI referees are tracking players in even on their limbs, on the, I mean, on the each part of, of, of the body. So probably you, you can see this camera and it's so advanced with, uh, I think not more than six cameras or something like that. Even uh, the something which is really interesting here is that there is a model that you can say, uh, Two words and it will generate uh, generate an image. I think this was like two years ago. It was the first model was the the Lee, and now it's an area of air of uh, com computer vision uh, diffusion. So here you say a horse and astronaut, and it makes it generates very realistic images. But even uh, two months ago, uh, there was a a small scandal, let's call it that way, that there was a contest, a art contest for uh, uh, among the artists and uh, the winner win with that picture. So, and it was uh, generated by, uh, by AI. So again, I think this was in New York. Uh, so you, you can see what kind of precisions, what kind of details you can check on internet for more details. Even under the water, <laughs> the AI is able to identify noise and from the from the from the real real sound. And uh, this and I mean there are many other advancements, but I just want to give you a kind of a text, images, how we learn, and and and, and other parts. So this was my idea to set the foundation. But now directly to the topic, uh, the topic of the retail. The retail, the retail and the overview, which I want to give you uh, here, I want to present you all the main uh, parties the, uh, which are involved there and how it works. Uh, my, my, so here, let's start with each retail. There is a manufacturer and normally they have a distributor or supplier. The distributor is the one who is responsible for selling the production. Normally, there is a shipment order which comes from the supplier. He is willing uh, such kind of sneakers or let's say or uh, shoes or uh, dresses or such kind of it. And then the manufacturers uh, ask from material supplier like uh, what kind of cloth or what kind of, uh, of other materials. 
Then once it's produced, there is a carrier, there is a warehouse, and then after the warehouse, it goes to the to the uh, to the supplier. And after that, supplier uses his network of stores or of, uh, of other sub sub suppliers to distribute uh, the production. So this is a global overview when we have a manufacturer and where the the, the stores goes and the distributors. But what about the retailer? The retailer, which is the the last part of the, of the first diagram, and how it works. Normally, how it works, a retailer, in order to sell something, uh, he needs products. He needs something from somewhere. So he works with the, normally one retailer works with minimum uh, ten suppliers. Imagine suppliers can be a suppliers of food. Uh, suppliers can be of uh, sports equipment. It can be Adidas, one supplier, Nike, another supplier. No matter, it's a brand. But uh, such kind of, of suppliers where they have uh, a lot of sub uh, products. So once once they have an order, then uh, the supplier provides the, the stock uh, to the warehouse. And once it's warehouse, then it's logical. The production goes to the stores, to the physical stores. They start selling. Also, uh, that information go to the marketing, so there is a signal start to make promotion. And uh, also, uh, when you when you have available products, you you put them on on the website on the website of the retailer. And uh, the marketing starts um, starts let's call it spending money uh, in terms of promotion. Promotion it can be in Google ads, Facebook ads, other digital channels. It can be television, it can be emails, radio, and such kind of stuff, with the main concept of uh, bringing traffic, traffic to the to the website or uh, or to the stores. And uh, once this is done, then we go. I mean, something which I really love and uh, um, just to uh, show is the digital part. The digital part, the e-commerce. The e-commerce, uh, here the main idea is, was to give you a broader picture and now to focus on the e-commerce side. So here for the site, we again have an interaction with the supplier and with the warehouse. The warehouse where the uh, the products the products are, are located. So uh, for the e-commerce, something which is very important and what we realized, there are two main... Um, parties, let's call it that way, it's a products because re uh, e-commerce without products, uh, what they're supposed to sell, they need products and, uh, yeah, and something else after the products, they need customers, they need someone, they need uh, someone who look, look into, the, into that website and start making purchases. So then we have uh, uh, shopping carts or uh, cart, so as, uh, I mean, they start uh, combining buying products. Uh, then they normally they make a purchase. And once the purchase comes, there are two different ways. One of them is uh, the the products can come directly from the supplier. It's called uh, drop shipping. Drop shipping uh, is uh, uh, and the other one is the the direct uh, direct sales, which is from the warehouse. Uh, advantages and disadvantages of the bow of the drop shipping and the direct sales. The drop shipping is uh, risk free because um, the site owner doesn't allocate any uh, any cash into the, into into products into having products uh, on its store. But uh, the disadvantage is that it takes time. It takes time for delivery. Uh, just to give you an example, for one of our customers. He mentioned that uh, when he said uh, he's he sold uh, different products, some of them are over drop shipping, some of them are they, they have them available on their warehouse. So he mentioned that uh, if a person goes to add to cart, around 80% of them, so you imagine four out of five, uh, if they see that there is a delivery longer than one day, uh, they pos postpone uh, and they uh, they didn't make a payment at all. So it's very important for from the customer perspective if the products can be delivered within uh, next day, within a day. And uh, and the disadvantage of uh, of this of direct sales is that 
someone needs to allocate cash. Cash uh, for having the products in their warehouse needs to maintain a warehouse also. Someone of uh, packaging, uh, expedition, and all this stuff. So I think this this is e-commerce on a on a broader view. Now uh, about the yeah I call the main actors in e-commerce, but uh, something which we see. Uh, as uh, main two main directions are uh, demand and supply integration. So what uh, what what does mean uh, supply supply itself is as I show show you uh, the products, the materials, the sourcing, the logistics, the operations which you are doing. Something what you have, uh, what the store have or the retailer have in order to sell. And uh, upstream suppliers, these are uh, these are like dropshippers. And the other part is the demand. The demand now we we are talking about marketing and sales. Uh, these are this is uh, the interest which uh, someone needs to uh, generate. Someone needs to bring uh, let's call eyeballs into your website. So uh, this supply and demand is very tricky because there are there can be a problems if you have a lot of products but you don't have a demand so you overstocked so you have a lot of uh, uh, products which are staying which you already paid and you are making losses but the other option is that uh, if you have bigger demand but you don't have stocks uh it is uh, you are wasting opportunities opportunities to make more cash and and to earn more so these are the two uh, so it's like um, jingling jingling you need to to be careful how you work with supply and demand and combine it and this is demand and supply integration normally how it works is um, first of all you need uh, if you can forecast the demand and based on the forecast of demand, can you allocate uh, proper supplies and such kind of it? So it's uh, the combination of it. It's very finance uh, intensive, and also it really depends of the strategic plan of the re retailer, because some of them can see can they say, okay, we are focusing on new products, or we are focusing on uh, more luxury products, or we are more brand oriented, high brand oriented, or such kind of it. So uh, it's always a combination between supply and demand. Uh, are you going to make such kind of forecasting from the demand and from the supply and then try to bridge them and minimize uh, the costs, um, the finance cost which you have? And uh, I think that's it. That's it from, from that point of view. Uh, what I just uh, hear for the... Uh, for the E-commerce, e-commerce itself, it's a kind of a combination. It combines uh, the, re the retail, but uh, everything is located digital on your, um, on your phone, on, on your browser, on, on your computer, on your website. So it's like, it is a digital, I, I love, love to say a digital retail. Digital retail, which is, uh, as I mentioned, we have products, and customers. So here, uh, I, I mentioned before that it's very important the products, uh, how they are located, how they're combined, how what's their availability. You know, in the store, you see the prices, uh, the promotion part, how the people, I mean, what are the main alleys? So it's like, what is your main, uh, main uh, page? Uh, where, which product you are showing, how you are showing them. So again, products, not only selection, but also location, personally, uh, uh, also the way they are combined different products. It is very important. Uh, also, sometimes for the products, uh, how you position them on your website. Uh, it's, it's an important part. And the next part is with the customers. We, we all know that uh, the they all say personalization is, is very, very important and trendy part. So it means that uh, if I left my email or something, they can send me a personalized messages and such uh, just to be relevant. 
but also something which is um, a new trend for the last two or three years. They call it a post-sales uh, customer experience. What it means post-sales? It means that uh, uh, it's not so important to convince me uh, retailers or e-commerce to convince me to buy once something. Okay, then they're talking about lifetime value and such kind of stuff. So they are trying to cross-sell or upsell other products to me. But something else which uh, big brands start realizing, let's bring more value to, the, to our customers, to our current customers. And how we are bringing this is like uh, if they are using, a, if they're not only buying the product, but start using it. Uh, just a comparison, uh, if I buy a cooker, I mean, something which uh, helps me cook whatever. I mean, it's like a robot or such kind of it. But imagine if I buy and I left it uh, on the shelf and I never use it. So the value is zero, zero to me. I will, I will never buy again something of that. Or I, I, I'm not happy with this purchase. So I will be give them a bad feedback and uh, et cetera, et cetera. But imagine if uh, that brand starts uh, educating me, start saying, um, do you know such kind of receipt? Uh, there is a month of uh, cooking uh, something particular. Some, uh, so then uh, if I start using it, it will bring much more value to me. Uh, if I start, let's say, sharing what I'm doing, it's even popular. Uh, I'm becoming a little bit more pop, 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 popular. Uh, if they are start engaging me in using this uh, uh, this cooker, uh, it will bring much more value to me, and I'll be more much more dedicated. Uh, the other example is uh, uh, this smart watches of uh, I forget the brand uh, of one of the brands. I mean of the smart watches. So they uh, what they're making a gamification. So they are checking, uh, are you walking? Uh, are you, they're uh, setting you some targets for today. Uh, walk uh, three, uh, 300 or 3000 steps more. Uh, then they're giving us some awards. Then you are able to share uh, this with, um, with your friends uh, just to start. Then you make some competition. So it really brings a value to you and uh, just you start using this um, trackers of the of the watch so this kind of it product and customers orientation then uh, something which is really comes natural into into the e-commerce and the way they treat and wants to be positioned is uh, the campaigns the communication itself i mean it's a combination of personalization or strategic uh, point of view of the retail comparing with the assortment of products which they have and how they combine it. Uh, are they going to make a campaigns which are educational? Are they going to make a personalized campaign? Are they going to make churn campaign? I mean, reducing churn and uh, preventing uh, from leaving such, uh, uh, such customer. So these three aspects uh, explains according to me and the experience which we have, uh, the main part of the of the uh, of this of uh, of the e-commerce. So we come, yeah, I'm a little bit running, but um, now we come to the next point, which is the data sources. The data sources, uh, which um, uh, yeah, probably just to come back is if we have normally uh, from your perspective as data science wanna be as someone who wants to solve problems. Uh, these are the three main aspects which we see in e-commerce where you can focus on and uh, find solution on that. So it can be a products text, it can be the products pictures, it can be products variation, it can be products assortment, it can be all, if you about customers, what kind of customers is doing, what kind of prediction or a kind of campaign. So these three, let's call them buckets, is something which uh, e-commerce pay attention on. So in terms of data sources, uh, yeah, uh, last week I was I was supposed, I, I, I made the explanation for one of my colleagues what kind of data sources there are. Uh, 
to tell you honestly, in e-commerce, they are a lot. I mean, I'm really surprised how many sources and uh, to combine them, it takes uh, time. Something which I really like to explain is um, you as a data science wannabes, uh, this data pyramid, or it's uh, it's not an edge plan, but it's very close if you want to make a data science. Uh, no matter is it a project, is it an institution, is it an organization, there are certain steps until you start uh, making a data science. And you, you need to be aware of, of them and, uh, and how it works. The first one is the data acquisition. It's like uh, you have a task and based on the task, you need to get a better understanding uh, what exactly is, is the concept behind and then start gathering data, start realizing what kind of data there is and can be used for that task. So here, in terms of data sources, um, uh, especially for the e-commerce, uh, you will see there are a lot of, uh, let's call them silos, silos of data, which, is, which, which can be gathered and can be used. The first one is the, uh, the information on the website. So the information on the website, you, you imagine uh, all products, all availabilities, or pricing, or uh, vendors, uh, descriptions. Also, uh, I didn't mention here uh, all, all orders which are happening, who is purchasing, what is purchasing. Uh, but also there is a kind of a uh, sometimes ERP system, which is related to the bigger retailer about overall availability, not only on the on the website, but also on the on different stores and different locations. And also the CRM system, we call this uh, a kind of an offline data. I mean, online is what you have seen on the website. Offline is when someone is making calls, when someone is, milk, is making other actions. Then we have a customer behavior. I really like this, this part. It is um, if you have heard about Google, Google Analytics, uh, they are doing almost the same. So it's like uh, we are tracking and, and it's nice to have a, on the, your website, where are the customers go, going? What are their paths? Which products after which products? Uh, which products they put in a, add to, a day add to cart? Which day they initiate checkout? They make a purchase? So such kind of, uh, of information of what is the customer behavior there. The next one um, are the social platforms. We all know the social platforms. So here the social platform, they have two aspects. One aspect of, aspect of the data is that uh, it can be for uh, information for your channels, for your Facebook, for your LinkedIn, for your Instagram, or uh, for, for the company. I mean, your, when I say your, I mean uh, uh, e-commerce, uh, e e-commerce e e uh, premise, e-commerce, uh, Facebook and LinkedIn. And, um, but also there is another stream from the marketers when they start making promotion. I mean, it's like Facebook ads, Google ads, LinkedIn ads, etc. This kind of information is really relevant. It's like um, the first kind of information which you can gather for your behavior of your products and customers. And then, the last one, which I like to say, this is uh, earn, earn customers, earn, uh, they call it earn marketing. It's when you already make, uh, make a deal with a customer, when you already have uh, get, uh, get an email or a, or a phone of, uh, of uh, someone, some of these customers. So you have them in your possession and you use like MailChimp or, um, S, uh, or SMS bump or uh, other email mar marketing or SMS platform for communication with them, with the respective messages. So imagine that uh, you can get all this data for the emails. Let's say you have what kind of uh, campaign you sent, what kind of, uh, so it was sent. Uh, does, does that email open it, click it, where it click, uh, then you can, for instance, uh, see where, when, where that person clicks, what kind of information there is, and such kind of additional data which you can take. So this kind of data sources we see as a foundation. Then 
then when we talk about data engineering, okay, now we have this this data, <laughs> what we are supposed to do. Uh, so it, it's it's natural, just uh, we need to start combining the data, get it from different sources and start finding some merges where that can be happen. Uh, but here, I just want to talk about how you extract the data. I mean, that was the sources. For instance, there is an API, it's application programming interface with um, some of the platforms. You can use um, Google Analytics for customer behavior. You can use um, uh, Google Ads and Facebook Ads API. So there are, uh, for the emails, again, there are API. So it's an interface for communicating because uh, that is uh, retail data uh, and he is, he's supposed to have access to that. And uh, that's that's the only way. Sometimes there are databases, databases which you are very familiar with. Uh, it can be the database for their ERP system, for their CRM system. Uh, ERP is enterprise uh, relation, enterprise uh, platform. It's um, it gathers information about the availability, production, and all this stuff. The CRM is customer relationship management, the communication with the customers their customers uh, then the next one uh, this is um, this is like the link on on the website how if you uh, sometimes they have five or six uh, website so how people are going from one side to another side how they are linked with it and the next one which <laughs> to tell you honestly when i started um, as a data scientist and i was curious about some project I started uh, with uh, scraping some data and that's the easiest, the fastest uh, and more common way of gathering some data. But uh, and uh, web scraping is just there is a website, you write a logic and it scrapes all the information and structure in the way you want to use it. Uh, this technique is used uh, if you want to take information from the competitors, if you want to compare prices of di different products. So uh, this is yeah, this is common way. Uh, also, don't forget that there are external data sources, uh, which you can access. I mean, it can be the weather, it can be the IP. Uh, there are a lot. You, there, uh, there are even some da data sets uh, as a data scientist, which you can play in Kaggle. We also have in Data Science Society some, uh, some, um, uh, some sources on Google. So after having this data, it comes the next part is uh, data quality cleaning. So here there are certain steps how to validate, to transform, to clean data, which is very important. Enrichment. Enrichment is um, when you use external data sources to enrich the data. For instance, very common technique is um, you have an IP, IP address of a particular customer where that, that person comes. But there are external databases where from this string you can get information from which country, which city, uh, which organization. Uh, because sometimes uh, the IPI possessed by organization. So uh, there is a task that uh, for the online stores, they, will, they can see from which company there is a huge traffic. Uh, so this kind of IP enrichment. And then the most important is to start unifying the data, combining this already prepared data into a way, which then you can make the next step, um, reporting and business intelligence. Here, I just want to mention that um, these three stages are very uh, labored, very, very heavy, uh, heavy work. And it's more or less, it's a data engineering part. And the last five years, there is a customer data platform as a term. And it's not only a term, uh, the main concept is that it combines data from various sources. So you can see here that uh, there are people on the website and uh, mobile and different places, and it starts gathering the information here. And once you want to make a particular action like uh, Facebook or some email marketing for the person, you just push particular action. So customer data platforms are are expensive, uh, probably bigger retailers are using it, but it is something which is which is growing. Just to give you a, 
an idea of customer data platform. There is a customer platform institute. And uh, I think uh, one, no, two years ago, I decided to make a research how many brands there are, how, how many products, how many uh, platforms for customer data platform. And I was shocked. <laughs> At that time, they were around 100. And uh, it's like kind of a must. Something which I recommend is You Know Me. It is open source. Uh, uh, Apache, Apache, You Know Me, which can be used. Uh, all the rest, uh, there are some open source stuff. There are some which are which are used, but uh, this is a good concept, especially if you. Uh, it's not common uh, the data scientists uh, to do these three down layers, but it's very important to understand what kind of data there is, to understand how it links one to each other, even to make some enrichment, in order to solve his tasks. And then we come, uh, when I say unifying the data, it's something that we combine different silos. And now, finally, we are able to start asking questions and receive answer. So this is done by uh, reporting and business intelligence. Again, there are a lot of advancement here. Um, you can very easily slice zoom in zoom out uh, it's uh, available uh, on different places uh, you can build some custom reports uh, so it's very easy to visualize data even you can start asking uh, normal normal questions and receive receive answers uh, this uh, in terms of platforms again there are a lot i will not yeah let's see the next one uh, we have this was Tableau, but also there is a click view, Power BI. There are many others. Something which I can recommend uh, is um, again uh, open source one, Apache Superset. Uh, it's an op open source uh, a uh, project of uh, Airbnb. So they did a really good job here. Uh, you can play with it, uh, it's free. And uh, you can receive, and it's very fast. It's much, much, even Tableau uh, was working with the Airbnb in order to improve their performance. And Apache Superset have awesome performance in terms of availability, requests, response, and such kind of it. And then Google Data Studio, I think even now they uh, changed the name, but uh, it's a, it is a very known uh, marketing BI platform. It's free. Uh, again, up to a certain amount, but uh, for uh, if you are not a big retailer like, uh, I don't know, what you have in India, like uh, Metro or uh, uh, Kaufland, no, I'm not quite sure what kind of uh, big uh, hypermarkets you have, uh, Google Data Studio can work really well. And uh, normally the marketing people knows this because they use it uh, for reading uh, information from the Google. And finally, <laughs> finally, once you combine the data, it comes the next part is uh, you understand the data, you see some dependencies, you make start asking some questions. Normally what I like to say is with the reporting and BI, you are looking into the past. To the past, if you have a real time, probably you can look into the current state. With the data science and AI, it is something like uh, you are looking into the future. You are start making prediction. You are start, you are start making to be awesome, just to be cool, and to see uh, to see some other some stuff like uh, you like or or Oracle uh, predicting the future. So. Um, uh, I was laughing there. There was a joke that uh, I'm predicting on, on data. So it was like a term. Uh, so it was, uh, it is, it is something which we need. And in, in for data science, again, it's again concept. Normally we have the storage layer. It can be relational database or for the big data, it can be Hadoop or Spark clusters. So here is a term uh, Spark. Spark is something which you need to process your data uh, for uh, if it, we, when we are talking about big data. 
yeah, we have sometimes business intelligence, which can answer some questions rel relatively easy and fast. Data science platforms, which are making something with the, with the data uh, and uh, returns predictions. These predictions can go to the some front end systems or business stakeholders. So here's like two, uh, two aspects because the predictions, uh, like uh, if you predict what, uh, what kind, uh, how much uh, products needs to be ordered. So it's automation. It automatically goes and uh, purchase, makes purchase order to the supplier, or it can um, go to the BI or it can go to the business stakeholder as a visualization, as, uh, as an Excel or such kind of it. So uh, data science platforms, again, very tense picture, uh, something which I really like and what I see as a best, um, best uh, in that sector, uh, Databricks. Databricks is a very advanced, they're really advanced in terms of running uh, models and combining, working with teams, uh, versioning of the model, versioning of the data. Uh, also, uh, we see that um, uh, Amazon, I'm just looking for Amazon, uh, yeah, Amazon SageMaker, which is almost, I mean, on each uh, part of it. So Amazon SageMaker, um, they automate a lot of the processes. Uh, it's very easy if you use Jupyter Notebook, you can make on Jupyter Notebook your, uh, your main uh, workflow. And uh, with the Lambda function, it can run automatically, auto scale. There are also Google, Google AI. Oh, something which I really like is um, Google Colab. It is it is a free, free, uh, free. Uh, it's like a Jupyter notebook. Uh, you have uh, the good part is that you have a GPU. So if you are working with the images, you are able up to 12 gigabytes or 12 or 16. I'm not quite sure to to run. Uh, I mean to make a computer vision uh, and. Uh, yeah, it's obvious if you want to make more complex stuff, uh, you need to pay for that. And what else we have? Data IQ. So there are such kind of platform, platforms. The main idea of these platforms, just to give you an idea, is not only to place your code, but also to be processed. Because it's very important sometimes to have uh, scalable solutions which can uh, which can be processed and return uh, uh, results within a meaningful period of time. Because if you are making, uh, just to give you an example of one of my first models, uh, I did the model and uh, it runs around 25 to 30 minutes, but the time discrete, it, it was supposed to be run on each 15 minutes. So it means that with every run, I have a delay with uh, 10 to 15 minutes. So it's not supposed to work that way. So you need to make optimization just to reduce the time and all this and et cetera, et cetera. So it's very important and also how fast uh, is your model? Because if you build a model which is supposed to be run daily and it runs uh, uh, two days, it doesn't make sense at all. What else, what else I think that's, that's for now. So in conclusion, uh, I just try to cover all the stages here uh, from the data. So uh, one, you have the problem identifying what are the data sources, then thinking about enriching the data, combining the Hello? data. Yes. Uh, yes. Actually, Shinto? we couldn't hear you uh, properly this last uh, one minute because of ah. the network issue. Can I just repeat one second? Um, uh, just a uh, just few seconds we couldn't hear you but can you hear me now because probably it can be a hand free uh, yes, yes, know, yes, but... yes 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 is it better now uh, it's fine it's fine yes 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 okay Please carry on okay if, yeah if you have any yeah just yeah because hands free battery uh laptop internet uh, only only, laptop. only few minutes i only have uh, sorry few seconds we couldn't hear you uh, no problem you please carry uh, okay. on uh, okay Okay, thank you, thank you, Chantal. Okay, so here, just in conclusion, I just show the framework, and I try to show you what kind of data there are. So, in terms of, uh, yeah, we come to the last part is the projects. 
here I decided to choose uh, two projects which are not very, not very standard. Uh, one of them is uh, for people localization. It is, uh, it is a case where we use uh, IoT, Internet of Things. So we are using sensors data. It's, uh, it's normally, I mean, this sensors, sensors data is normally used to uh, learn in um, technical universities. So it's like a time series, time series and how it's done. And then Bulgarian article advisor this is uh, something relevant to, to, to text. And now you will see a Cyrillic, I mean, the Bulgarian uh, alphabet. So let's jump into that. So in terms of, uh, so here about the people, people localization, here we, are, we were supposed to use sensors. Uh, the, the main constraint was, uh, the main task was to be able to track into a hypermarket where the people are going. I mean, what's their path? What, what's their pattern there? What they are doing there? So it's very important for the merchandisers. Uh, what is merchandisers into one hypermarket? It's very important how and where the, two, the, the, the products are uh, situated. What height? Uh, where in the location? Normally they, uh, they even uh, play with the light to reduce the light or increase the light for some products uh, which are on sale. So they wanted a high precision, uh, if possible, not to be dependent on battery or at least uh, not to be needed each day or e once, once per day or once per week, something to be charged. Fast deployment, easy maintenance and, and for sure low cost. <laughs> And uh, for these constraints, uh, we decided to use uh, EMU. It's an inertial measurement unit. Inertial, inertial, inertial measurement unit, it combines uh, gyroscope, magnetometer, and accelerometer. I will explain you what each one of them is doing. Uh, but here, the main concept was that this plus um, one uh, Bluetooth, uh, uh, Bluetooth receiver, uh, we were able to, and uh, we put a processor there, we were able to gather information from these sensors, uh, store it, process it on a small computer, and then uh, transmit it uh, on a receiver. And then once we have this data, we can, uh, we can start finding where that person goes and what he was doing. With the battery pack of this, uh, it was supposed to last between uh, 8 to, to 15 months without need of be charged or change and such kind of it. So that was the limitation about the accelerometer. Accelerometer is, um, it is, uh, it change, uh, it, uh, this is the second derivative or the first derivative of speed. So what it means, it means that uh, acceleration is when you, uh, this is the change of speed. So you have a distance. If you uh, make a movement, it's like uh, the speed, which is the first derivative, and then you have the second derivative. So uh, pay attention on the derivatives part, what it means physically. Uh, physically. So it, if you change, for instance, here, this uh, red, uh, this uh, blue and green means that uh, it was staying, let's say that way, we can change it that way and return it back something. There was a rotation or something in, a, in the, in the um, one, one plane. I mean, it's not like, because if uh, there was supposed an X to be changed, if we are making such kind of complex movement. So the acceleration, uh, normally it's, uh, how it works there is a uh, this is like a, a small uh, a small sensor so if there is a movement it is so sensible that it starts moving left or right and it just shows the difference so this is based on the time so for nine seconds uh, there were changes in the acceleration for x y and z uh, there are certain ways how to compute it uh, yeah if you know derivatives, it's, it's easy. Then the, the gyroscope, the gyroscope 
this is um, something which was discovered uh, from Portuguese for traveling. Uh, the gyroscope uh, in its essence is just the it, it's compute the changes of the of the velocity of the velocity all over x y and z so here it shows that um, okay it aggregates some errors so you can see uh, here it shows that there is a change with 90 degree 90 degree 90 degree over a, a certain uh, over x y or, or z uh, so it uh, uses earth gravity to help determine the orientation. And the last one is magnetometer. It's like our digital compass. So it gives you information uh, from zero to 360, uh, where are you located? What's your, uh, what, what's the, the sensor uh, situation of it? So all of this, they were so good, uh, but uh, the challenges, that uh, derivative of derivative or only one derivative, the, it uh, aggregate errors and there are a lot, a lot of errors. So just to give you an example, here is like uh, when they are walking, uh, it starts uh, changing. I think here on the next slide, here it shows that, I mean, this end was supposed to, to end here. And normally it accumulate error, which can last like if you walk 200 meters, uh, the error can, can be from 10 to 50 meters. So it's a, it's a huge one. So uh, we use uh, different uh, compensation filters. Uh, there was additional hardware to clear the error, but we didn't use that. And we start using some models. Uh, Models which are based on on the, on the models which are used for uh, uh, I don't know have you heard but uh, Range Rover have sent uh, uh, this uh, moon uh, moon cars car not moon uh, Mars for the uh, the cars which are going to be on Mars and they will be uh, uh, auto uh, autonomous so uh, the models there it's uh, there on the base, base, base mat mathematics, and some of them are using Kalman filters. Here we use a particular area of that, of, of this, it's called uh, particle filters. Particle filters, I will show you how they works. They are, uh, the good part with the particle filter was that uh, uh, you need uh, to put uh, as an input, how noisy are you, is your signal. And uh, if we say that the signal is noisier, we have a higher precision, but you need to be careful because if you say that the sensor is, uh, that the data from the sensor is too noisy, it uh, doesn't work work uh, well at all. So for instance, uh, how it begins, I mean, it was a project, it was like two years ago. Uh, here is the, it's like a prototype, how it works. We connect it with my laptop. So yeah, initially I started to my, uh, some, uh, experiments at home and then I was uh, this is uh, one of the biggest um, retailers uh, Kaufland so we were in one of the stores so even it's like a mask at that time I was supposed to wear wear and we have um, this is the diagram of the um, this is the map of the of the store so I think uh, he was long like 200 met meter to 100 meters uh, height and weight and uh, yeah, yeah. And here was my phone. Just I was supposed to enter and uh, how much time I spent. So how it works? Uh, just to make a visualization. This is the map of the store. The the turtle here is where we are, and the yellow, uh, the gray dot is where the model says that we are supposed to be. Uh, you see small jumps. This because. Um, I will just visualize uh, after 10, 10 or 15 steps. So you see, here is the turtle and here is uh, the more model wear predict. So really, re relatively fast, it starts to find where the turtle is. Now here there is an error, but then it finds it here and just start tracking it and chasing the turtle wherever the turtle goes. Uh, so yeah, here now it's here, now it's here. So it works really well. Uh, I think uh, this was like 
20 minutes of walking no uh, or 12 12 minutes of walking so you see how it works it just follows uh follows where where it goes so um we also built another model another model uh, so it was the same model but we put a logic that on each uh, 20 minutes uh let's try to find out where uh, let let's uh, let's get lost and again try to find where the uh the the this card this uh, shopping cart is so in each uh, 20 minutes we were losing uh, uh where the cart is just to be sure that if there is an error and uh, let's say let me just show and let's say that uh, there is an error and it starts showing that we are here but probably we're on the other end just to to recalibrating the system and something else that the map here, uh, normally here was the entrance and here were the cashiers. So they have like 15 cashier. Uh, and uh, something else, what we did was that um, uh, in the uh, autonomous drive, um, car drive, uh, cars, uh, there is another model of uh, where you can uh, build a map because this was pre-built, it was defined by, by us. Uh, there is a slum, slum models. So this was also something which we, we considered and we did. So uh, it's a very interesting way how we uh, use a technique from the autonomous, uh, late, uh, from the autonomous cars and apply it uh, to track the movement of, uh, of these uh, shopping carts. And it works really, really well with, uh, with the data we have uh and i think that's it for that project um the next one i will jump to the next one is just bg bulgarian article advisor here uh one of a friend of mine uh so just it's an online magazine it's a bulgarian science uh they started in 2005 they have over 7,000 articles uh, they were selling a subscription to to this website mm. And they have a lot of networks, channels. I mean, for your scale, I don't know that 58K is a lot, but uh, for us, it's like, I mean, we are uh, 7 million, uh, million countries. So for us, it's, uh, it's, it is, it, it's okay. So here, the main idea was, um, he said, Sergey, mm, I have a lot of articles but uh, you can imagine that i'm a little bit uh, constrained of this how many articles we are we are able to write in what area what kind of topics what kind of words what kind of uh, information is probably most relevant and important for our uh, for our subscribers and i just want to be relevant for that and can you help me on this so here uh, the goal setting was uh, yeah the marketers to be more effective to provide such kind of deeper analysis of, of topics and uh, word level, also to support the process of choosing uh, what kind of new articles to, to write down and uh, yeah, and direction if needed. So here with the data, we have yeah, scrapped our articles uh, and email campaigns data over 8,000 entities. These are the articles. We have click data. This is what I call you behavioral. I mean, what they are doing on the website, what kind of traffic it is. It, uh, we have the demographics of some of their customers. It, they have over 27K emails and uh, say, oh, almost a million uh, events, events which we were tracking. This event were a combination of the emails and uh, what they were doing on the website. And it is for the last, last seven months. So, that was the constraints which we have and then we come to the research to the research uh, at that time there we found so that i think this is a project three years ago uh we find uh, to use three techniques tfidf topics extraction and uh, sentence embedding uh what what it it mean it means let me just check do i uh, yeah, I will explain it later on. Okay, uh, so uh, so being able to evaluate it means to make a meaningful analysis and to answer on some of the their main questions which I mentioned to you. 
The first one we use the TF-IDF. What is TF-IDF? TF-IDF is um, like, um, I'm just trying to, so there are words. We are, uh, for each, imagine for each article, we start counting how many uh, words are used. So let's say there are words like good, bad, uh, this, that, which are very common and they have a high volume, like they have more, more than 1000 time used. But then we go on the another article and again, uh, this, these uh, words are used so frequent. And then the third and then the fourth. And if you start thinking about, okay, what kind of value uh, I have if I show that good is, uh, is very, uh, is very uh, distant, is, uh, is a high volume data. Uh, it's nothing, but if you start using, if you start comparing words, which are very common on particular article, but really rare on, on another article. So it means that probably this word is very descriptive for that particular article. So TFIDF, uh, let's say uh, if I write for submarines and uh, normally all the rest is written for uh, health, for uh, well-being, for uh, corruption and such kind of stuff. But if I have um, submarine in, in an article, in our particular article, they will have very high, high, um, very high uh, score, and it will mean that it's very precise and it's very relevant for this one. So we make TFIDF on the subject level only and on the text level. So we yeah, have, you can excuse me, it's in Kyrillic, but uh, that's the way then we present it to them based on the score, how big uh, the words are. So it was like. Uh, question, which are the more relevant and distinguished word. And here we visualize them. So uh, this Podvodnica means submarine. Uh, these are some uh, uh, accountants. There's um, a lot of interviews, projects, and that was uh, there the most important and relevant to them. And especially for the text, again, we have, I mean, it was for Bulgarian uh, science. So there was for people, kids, uh, places, Europe. This is Europe. This is world, earth. I mean, some of the most common words which they they seen and uh, with a very high score, which are uh, which can be used in that direction. Then we did the topics extraction. The topics ex extraction here is the demo. Here on the left side are the most are the defined topics and the science of it is a, a topic distribution and how far or how close it is, it shows what's the relation beneath. I mean, some of them are within uh, inside. And on the right side, these are uh, the explanation words. You have the overall term frequency and estimated term frequency within the selected topic. So the, uh, the blue means overall. Uh, term frequency. So this is world. Word is used overall a lot, but the red one means that it's how relevant it is for that particular topic. So this do you see that uh, it's very used for this topic. Uh, and uh, for instance, this one, uh, this one is called dead. It half of the time, uh, let's see half of the time is used for this, um, uh, for this segment. The rest of it uh, is not. So here you can also play with the slider to adjust relevance metric. So if we put relevance, it's almost 100% relevant. So how relevant these are. So you can, so they can play that what, what we developed to them. And for instance, uh, this one is for country, Germany, Switzerland, Ang England, Japan. So it's like uh, probably, uh, China, America, and such kind of stuff which are um, which are relevant uh, to that topic. So it's more uh, probably a geographic uh, topic, this one. Let me check if there is different which is used. Uh, the previous one, which was here, it was for the Christianity, God, and all this uh, saint. Uh, let's see this one. No. Okay, so it was like, uh, so each topic 
uh, each topic it shows which word are best uh, best describing best describing uh, that so it was very easy for them to identify okay we have around 20 topics and each topic is relevant to this one or that one and uh, the next part we use uh, BERT uh, text embedding huh. BERT, BERT, BERT is a transformer technique uh, I will not dive into this what the transformers are it's a, uh, it is a uh, it was state of the art uh, for the last uh, five five years in the working with text. The main concept of BERT is um, it was able to pre to predict what is going to be the next word. So it was like um, uh, uh, if we have uh, it is uh, it is uh, very sunny and it will predict day. E or if you say. Uh, the, if it is, uh, uh, I really like to eat hot, it will predict dog, uh, hot dog, yeah, or such kind of it. So yeah, it has uh, information about the semantic itself. So we use here text embedding uh, in order to position based on the text. Imagine this on the left side. Uh, we uh, to position where each article stays based on the content inside. So here probably this can be for the politics, this can be for health, and this can be for something else. So it was really obvious that there are several clusters. We, uh, and the size, the size of uh, the position depends on the context, what's written inside the text. So uh, how the BERT works, there are pre-trained uh, pre uh, models. So you put an article, you need to prepare it in a certain way. And it position it um, your article somewhere. It gives uh, embeddings. Embeddings. Imagine it's like a vector of uh, normally it's 300 uh, digits from uh, 300 digits. But now we use a technique just from this 300 digits to make it to two digits. I mean x and y in order to be able to visualize this. So each article, it, each of these 7,000 article is situated somewhere. The size of the balloon is based on the uh, number of views each article has. And uh, then what we did, we, we did, I think, around 50 clusters, tried to cluster uh, different articles. So here we have this kind of clusters. Uh, I mean, the yellow, the light green, the dark green, the purple, and the different colors. So here, how they use this information. It was interesting that once we made the clusters, and once they see that one article is very close to the other, they visually were able to, um, to, to define some of their topics. Because before that, writing for science, uh, okay, they, they didn't put any tags. Uh, and uh, the information there was really sparse. So this, they first of all identified that they have some uh, topics. Also, what they identified that um, uh, let's say this big article is very relevant to the other 10. And what they find that after a niche article, they put uh, related articles and they just link with, uh, with the articles below. So in that case, this traffic here starts bringing traffic to, to the other articles. And also uh, they were able based on the, uh, like if we see this yellow, it's very balanced in terms of volume. Uh, to start uh, discovering on which big balloons uh, they are, it's worthy to to start uh, planning some of the some of the some of the next topics and next article, and uh, yeah, and that was for this project. So they use it, uh, and it was yeah, they show good results on that. So in conclusion. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I was I, I was finished soon. So uh, I tried to give you a kind of AI advancement. AI advancement uh, here. Keep in mind that whatever I mean, what I show to you, it's uh, very accessible. Uh, we are really, I mean, we are data science society, and me personally, very very believe in open source uh, science. 
so uh, a lot of uh, code is on github everything uh, all papers which you're reading most of them have code on, uh, on a github so this advancement if you are curious start start playing with them i mean it doesn't take too much time for instance for the diffusion to run a model it can be with uh, with a less less than a day diffusion model is when you put some words and it generates images uh, for the others reinforcement okay for some of them there are certain specifics but everything is accessible for the retail overview i just want to put you in a different place just to get understanding uh, the data the problems and about the examples i hope uh, i mean they were slightly different i mean from the normal predict weather predict uh, uh, volume predict uh, revenue predict sales just want to show you something which is outside of the of the normal uh, normal predictions of the of the demand and uh, i hope it was useful if you have any questions uh, yeah now is now now is now is the time to ask me also you can uh, find me on uh, linkedin on twitter i on twitter i'm not very active but on linkedin you can ask some questions so thank you and i hope you enjoyed this one hour and 15 minutes <laughs> thank you uh Sergei. it is a very interesting and the new things we have learned from your uh, extensive talk it is uh, really very informative and uh, i feel there's uh, our students and colleagues who are attending your sessions so they are maybe curious about a uh, couple of points so i may request uh, the participants if you have any question or maybe query uh, you please ask the great data scientist present here so over to you the audience you just unmute uh, yourself and then you can just have a discuss so by the time one point is uh, many of our students are good writers also so when uh, looking about this science magazine and then some writer we were asking for so I feel this our students will be interested to, to be part of that. So we'll discuss uh, separately on that. So anyone having any uh, query, you please unmute. Or you can you can use uh, the chat uh, to write your questions there. So it's the communication yes. is open. Yes. Uh, you can use the chat also. So. Can you unmute yourself? Anyone, if please check. Is the unmute option is enabled? Yes, sir, it's available. So, do you have any query? Uh, please discuss. Anyone? Well, I think the students are thinking about what is the question. So, so I, I I have one query. Uh, actually, uh, related to this machine vision uh, that you are collecting the data and then you are using some clustering on that. So, which tool is best for this clustering? So, in your recent that is the last topic you actually done so many clustering part on this uh, write up sections, right? So. What kind of tools we need to use for that? It's a more popular tool. Yeah. Uh, really good question of it. I mean, normally what I'm, what my beliefs are that uh, you need to use something which is uh, accessible and I really like the open source part. So what it means that uh, I, I like to use uh, everything and I use Python. Okay, you can use or R or Python. But uh, based on that, uh, you just write uh, a function which it can be came in, it can be whatever you want. Uh, there are different techniques. Normally, uh, normally when I'm wondering what to use, I spend some time uh, making a research, like what kind of clustering technique there are. I mean, you spend some time now, you learn more, and then and then uh, working on that. Probably, uh, so I, I use Python. Item primarily, uh, uh, so it really depends. 
because if you are restricted from from data, uh, because if you need to, to run it on, uh, I mean, you can uh, use uh, on Python standard uh, libraries like Scikit-Learn, Pandas, uh, and the others. But if you uh, are supposed to work on big data and use it Spark, it's a different story. You need to write it on Spark. So it just it it sometimes you are restricting on restricted on this how you compute the data and what how fast you want to receive results. So if, if it is on Spark again similar techniques, but uh, the code is different, the concept is different. And uh, something else for the clustering, it's very tricky. Just to share with you uh, how many clusters to make. It's a never ending uh, question. Normally we speak with the business. Uh, even uh, this week we have a meeting uh, with Financial Times. Uh, they have a research department and they were making uh, clustering and I asked them, okay, how many clusters? And they said, okay, business came and said not, not more than 20. But uh, sometimes there are different evaluation techniques like Silhouette and the other which you can learn. Again, they can give you some general overview of the clustering. Sometimes I prefer only to use distance and uh, get out, out of the clusters, but it really depends. Okay. Thank you so much for this nice answer. So another part is that uh, when you are talking about some research or you are thinking about some project, so we are looking for for the data as a real life data, right? Mm -hmm. Now that data receiving and then collection is a huge task. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some idea, but uh, based on the data, without lagging on the data, we can't go for the further modifications on our methods or we can't test. So some repositories are there, but uh, do you prefer any kind of repository which can be uh, useful for the starting for any any kind of data scientist or maybe who are working on this data science uh, to model some problem? Yeah, I mean, uh, in terms of data, so you're asking about data sources? Yes, yes. Okay, so yeah, I, I get your point. So, uh, to be honest, I mean, uh, now, comparing to the time when, when I was practicing, uh, now there are huge sources, data sources. Uh, there are, I think, Google, is, is my screen still shared? Uh, it is. Yes. Uh, oh, oh, okay, it doesn't need to share it, but okay, there is a Google, I think Google, uh, Google also in AWS, they have also shared the data, the data sources. They are huge, especially if you are looking for e-commerce, they have a lot. Uh, in Kaggle, there are at least three or four contests with the uh, e-commerce data. I think also in Data Science Society, because we, we were also doing uh, uh, hackathons with data, we call them datatons. So I think we also have data there. Uh, so it's only a matter of, Five minutes. Uh, I mean, to find the right keywords, which 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 you need in order to find a, a data set. Uh, then, how big it is? Probably uh, you need to go in uh, platforms like on uh, Google or on uh, uh, AWS, where they can grant you access to S3 buckets or so, so, such kind of stuff. But the data is there. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, students, do you have any query? So, can you just unmute and then speak out about your question? Uh, sir? Hello. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, yes, sir. So, my question is, uh, how can we collect data such as um, uh, like voice recording or facial expression, like images and audio, how can we collect such type of data? So you, you're asking for audio and uh, video, am, am I correct? Yes, sir. yes, audio and vision. Yeah, okay, so for audio and video, 
first of all, uh, the cheapest camera which you can take, I mean, uh, or even this one, this one is, is having the camera and, uh, and the audio. Uh, it re re really depends on the projects which you want to, to start working on. Uh, so uh, normally, when we have this, is just uh, see what is the scope. I mean, if you need to work with images of uh, uh, DNA or such kind of stuff, okay, I mean, you need a microscope, so you can't really find it, so you need to look for resources. But if we are talking about facial expression recognition, uh, also uh, this on Kaggle. I think on Kaggle, they have annotated data with the bounding box and all this. Also something else is um, mm, there are models which are already trained. Uh, so they have like uh, uh, this with the object de detection, for instance. But uh, yeah, primarily look for the data sources uh, because if there are if there is a model for um, uh, the ImageNet, probably you know this one of one of one of the biggest. Uh, uh, open source uh, data source, which is annotated with text and an image. So there are there are a lot. It really depends. I mean, something which I mentioned with camera is if you have something which is uh, uh, out of the regular models. If you if it is something specific, normal. And uh, I think that's it. Thank you. So, right, so thank you. you. Anyone else yeah. uh, to ask any query? We have a uh, sort of time. So anyone quick? Anyone having any query so far? I think uh, no. So thank you so much, uh, Sergey. So uh, it's a beautiful uh, discussion, and then uh, uh, you have uh, done uh, Tegula's one presentation, and it is really informative. Many new things we learned, and then we try to apply. Um, our students also very curious with me, and they have to learn so many things because whatever you have discussed is a very real life situation that uh, on the real life market actually you are uh, processing all things and then developing many projects. So thanks a lot once again uh, for joining and giving your time. Uh, we'll meet you soon in another occasion. So we have a big agenda that you already started. So uh, I, I am waiting for your some observation and then other suggestions on that. Okay. So mm -hmm. we'll uh, separately can discuss uh, about the students' activities uh, with the data science and the other part. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, Okay, thank you. It was a pleasure and I hope that you enjoy it and speak soon. Surely, sure, certainly. So I'm thanking to all uh, participants present here. It's just uh, a small request that uh, one Google form shared in the chat box. You please fill this Google form who could uh, share this part. Thank you all. Uh, have a good day. Thank you, sir. So we'll leave it. Bye -bye.